And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from Evil Beagle Games, and and the... and... The, the people behind Prowlers and Paragons, and now it's and now it's upcoming setting Blood and Justice. Welcome to Nocturne. The one, the one and only Bill Keys. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing great. Thank you for inviting me here. Thank, thank you for, thank you for coming on and braving the hell of time zones to make it up here. So, <laughs> I seem to say that every, I seem to say that every week. <laughs> Probably because it's true. <laughs> but a tradition around here is to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So with that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what was it that made it stick? Wow, we're going way back in history here. <clears throat> um, I was in, I think, fifth grade... Um, and a friend of mine said, hey, do you want to come over and play Dungeons and Dragons? And I had no idea what he was talking about. I asked him if it was like a board game or what. Um, he said no. We spent the rest of the afternoon creating characters. Um, and, um, it just, it was just really cool for me to be able to create. It, it wasn't like any game I'd ever played before, so I could create my own character Give him, you know, a personality, give him a background, give him, you know, draw his picture. Mm. Um, I was just so excited about this this whole new concept that I'd never heard of before. And of course he got killed like a day later in in the first dungeon we did, but you know. Oh that's, in, that's <laughs> by then it was to too late for me. Kind of, the the mantra we have here in the temple is the dice gods show no mercy. <laughs> yes, that was true. And when it now when it comes to now um that when it comes to super supers games which um, Prowlers and Paragons most definitely is um, that leads me to ask what was your first introduction to the idea of role playing games within the superhero end of things? Um, my first superhero role playing game, like a lot of people of my generation, was Champions. Um, I saw a copy of the box. Boy, that tells you how old I am, because it came in a box. Um, I saw a copy of the box in a comic book store, and I begged my mother to get it for me. And um, eventually I begged her enough that she did, and I spent, um, gosh, I think that winter break, that Christmas break, just making characters, um, because the system was so different. You know, uh, Champions was not a role system you, you didn't roll up your characters you actually bought you spent points to buy your powers and your statistics and things mm -hmm. which was a completely again completely new experience for me it's a, yeah i can definitely i can definitely see i can definitely see that because i've um even to this day i've seen people jump into a more supers um, apropos game especially with the popularity of the mcu and the like and then and then have a deer in the headlights look when they realize that they don't that there's not a class that they can really build around. Right. Oh. It's yeah, it, uh, it makes your characters more per. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I was just, I was just gonna say it's it's one of those it's one of those unfortunate pitfalls that um I don't think a supers game is ever going to truly get a, get fully around or fully past. Like it's always going to be there in some form or another. Yeah, you really have to walk into a superhero game, kind of already knowing the type type of character you want to play, um, because otherwise you can get analysis paralysis, and you just have so many options. There's so many cool powers and so many abilities and so many things you can do. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a, a pretty firm grasp on how you want to do it, then it can be really overwhelming. Now, when it comes to when it came when it came to the creation of um, pro of 
prowlers and paragons. Was that was that just the case of everybody constantly, everybody in your group constantly house ruling um, champions or or it or its equivalent and deciding, you know, why don't we just do it? Why don't we just do it ourselves? Or was it, was there a different path? Um, well, I'm I was one of the early playtesters for prowlers and paragons, but I am not the creator of the uh, rule system itself. Mm -hmm. So um, I can I can tell you all kinds of things about uh, when we were playtesting, uh, finding holes in the systems that we wanted to patch, um, finding things that we wanted to, you know, powers that nobody had thought of uh, in a game before or, or was very rarely seen in games, mm -hmm. um, how to do that and how to make things that were really cool, um, powers that you could use, uh, and and that you could be excited about, but would not overwhelm the game. So we did a whole lot of that in playtesting. Yeah, and speaking of speaking of that, when it came to playtesting, were there ever any instances of um, of you guys finding some you guys finding something that was not accounted for that could be that could be a potential breaker? Yeah, I'll tell you. Uh, fairly early on. Um, one of our playtesters was he created a character that was a duplicator, you know, somebody who could create multiple versions of himself. Yeah, multiple. Man. Um, like, in, yeah, like uh, Madrox the Multiple Man from Marvel, or like um, Duplicate from uh, Invincible. Mm -hmm. um, and we found out that that was incredibly overpowering <laughs> at first, um, because if you have a full powered character, if then that's that's one thing, but if you've got ten full powered characters on the on the board at a time, um, wow, you've really dominated the battlefield. <laughs> so we worked around and we found some solutions to that, and uh, I think the power is extremely balanced now. It mm. it really works well. Yeah, yeah, it's that's one of those things that it. I feel I feel like one phrase that should that should never be should never be said by any designer is it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> yeah well we play tested the heck out of uh pnp for a very long time we we had a campaign going for i want to say about two years mm -hmm. um different characters different power levels um you know everything from uh more or less street level characters all the way up to uh people who were as powerful as someone like thor or iron man um extremely powerful uh, earth stomping characters and um, the system works really well for really any one of those um, different superhero genres, you know. Mm -hmm. And when it came to when it came to when it came to trying to to set to settle down what um, what Prowess and Paragons was going to be when it came to its resolution system was that relatively consistent throughout the playtest or were there some elements that had to get thrown out because it was because it was painting the design into a corner um yes yeah, so um the main core mechanic of Prowlers and Paragons is that you roll a die six mm -hmm. and um two four and six are successes and one, three, and five are failures. So you roll a number of d sixes equal to whatever your power is. So you've got ten dice in an energy blast. Mm -hmm. um, you roll your dice. You count up your number of successes. Um, early on, we were thinking that maybe if you roll a six, something really cool should happen. So we were thinking, well, how about if your dice explode and you get to re-roll uh, every time you roll a six? And that didn't really work so well. So we eventually settled on um, a six is now counted as two successes. So mm -hmm. uh, two or four is one success, six is two successes. Um, and it works really, really well. Mm. It really makes you feel powerful. Um, if you if you get a good roll, when you get a good roll, um, boy, I, we were playing in a, a game about two weeks ago, a uh, superhero game, and um, somebody rolled 10 dice and ended up getting... I think 15 successes just because he rolled a lot of sixes in that. And man, the whole table just exploded. We were so, everybody was cheering and yelling and it was, it was just really, really cool um, when it happened. Now, when it comes to, when it comes to, now, when it, now that brings me to, um, 
to the setting that you have here with with Blood and Justice, which, given that given that it's it's um that it's described as vigilante action, would it be fair of me to say that you're trying to go for more of a Iron Age kind of approach? Well, that is exactly what I'm doing. I'm, I'm definitely going for that uh, the feel of a late 80s or 90s style comic books, mm -hmm. kind of the image era of comic books. Um, that is definitely what I'm going for. Yeah. Um, and give, given that, the uh, an obvious question that I have to ask, especially since over the years some people have looked at that particular era um, less fondly, is... To you, what's the appeal with that particular era in comics? Um, that is a really great question, and you're right. There are a lot of people who kind of um, look back, um, look askance at the, at that era. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there was a lot of things that were sort of overdone, um, and it got tiresome after a while, you know, when every single superhero was carrying a katana and a giant gun. Um, you know, there was there was a, a Fantastic Four comic book where uh, the thing was wa walking around with guns. It just didn't make sense, you know? People were like, well, you're just jumping on the bandwagon, and that doesn't make any sense to, to have a character who's super strong and made of stone and carrying a gun. Why would he have to do that? Um, so, yeah, there is a lot of... I don't know, kind of weirdness that went on at that time where everybody was just jumping on the bandwagon. But for me, there's there's a lot of a lot of junk that came out of that era, but there's a lot of really great stuff that came out of that era as well. Mm -hmm. um, some of the things that influenced me were like The Crow, both the comic book and the movie. And if you look at that, that's it's it's like a work of art almost. It's it's violent, it's dark, but it's beautiful in its own way. Mm-hmm. Um, things like um, Martial Law, um, if you remember that comic book. I think I remember. Um, there was a lot of it was, yeah, it was it was dark and it was gritty and it was grim and there was a lot of bloodshed, but it was also very funny. You know, they the some of the great people, the the people who were really good at what they were doing, uh, the artists and the writers, they could take this gritty and grim and dark world and make something really cool out of it. And that's what I'm trying to emulate. You know, that's what I'm trying to get into in this book is not just kind of the silly belt pouches and giant katanas that everybody had, but kind of the, uh, I don't know, the, the ballet of violence that you see in movies like The Crow mm -hmm. or the dark humor that you see in, in things like uh, Martial Law um, and, and other books at the time. Something else that comes to mind when it comes to the, when it comes to trying to emulate this that particular style is the um, animated attempt with the Punisher, not not with the Punisher, but with um, Spawn. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you know that the the whole image era gets a lot of will make a lot of fun of it, um, and rightfully so because a lot of it was just junk, but. Um, a lot of it was really good. Some of the stuff that came out of Wildstorm Studios, uh, Wildcats, and Stormwatch, mm -hmm. um, those were actually really good. Um, and they lived well beyond um, the era. I mean, you still, um, you were still seeing things like The Authority up until a couple years ago, I think. Yeah, and uh, I'd say I'd say a lot of the, um, a lot of the, a lot of that, a lot of the. Um cast under the Wildstorm banner when Wildstorm was handed over to DC um, st still see their fair sh mm -hmm. still see their fair share of use from time to time um, of course the thing the thing that was ironic when it came to Wildstorm is a is another label that was um, that was operating wrong alongside it um, America's best comics which was run by Alan Moore and w and mm -hmm. things got very awkward when when Jim Lee who owned Wildstorm sold it to DC because there is no love lost between DC and Alan Moore. <laughs> right. Yes. Um. And he. Yeah, that was <laughs> was weird. The funny thing is, he ba he basically had an he basically had an attitude throughout the whole thing of, I'm going to be professional about this, even though I wouldn't piss on you if your hair was on fire. Just stay out of my way. <laughs> 
Mm-hmm. But DC had a problem, and it's mainly because of the fact that you need an I and a K to spell to spell out their actual name. So they ended up meddling anyways. But I can I I get the feeling that a lot of people a lot of people when they um when they mock this particular era of co- of comics, the main thing that they're focused on is the excesses that were brought about by Rob Liefeld and his imitators, which, to be fair, um, McFarlane did call Liefeld the idiot, and he did, <laughs> and um, he certainly did not do himself any favors with how, with how he managed to piss off. Not only his own partners in Image, but also some of the people at Valiant during the Deathmate crossover that didn't work out as planned. Um, mostly because of the fact that he could, that he couldn't really understand the concept of punctuality, to the point where his ink his anchor <laughs> staged a sit in at his house, which this. But I can only I, I would pay to be a fly on the wall for that kind of situation of of your anchor showing up saying I'm not leaving here until you get until you give me the art you're supposed to do. Um. But I do I do think especially especially as the decade went on that there that there were legitimate attempts to try and to try and right the ship. Um. Unfortunately that unfortunately. The Liefeld stuff was the one that was the most out there, get, getting his own jeans commercial and all that. So that's what people look at when it comes to that era. Yep. But this this brings me to this brings me to a bit of a question that's always a bit of a tricky thing when it comes to when it comes to supers games. Um. I found I found that as as you as a campaign goes on and you end up giving experience in order to in, that can be used to increase powers, skills, and and whatnot. It gets trickier and trickier with a lot of games to try and maintain that street level feel. Um, where it's oh, mostly because by the, mostly because by the time somebody's late game in a lot of games with a traditional advancement setup. They're um, they're far they're as far removed from street level as you can get. So, how do you maintain that particular power scaling within um, something like Nocturne? Um, yeah. Okay. So in Prowlers and Paragons, um, you have different levels of play, mm-hmm. um, and this isn't levels like in Dungeons and Dragons, but this is uh, uh, essentially point levels that you can spend, and also um, level caps house strong your abilities can be. Um, generally speaking, in Nocturne, in Blood and Justice, your powers are capped at 10 dice. Mm-hmm. Can't really go any higher than that. So we'll... dice for, um, say, for instance, um, your uh, if you've got a, like an, uh, a fire blast that you can shoot at people. If you've already got 10 dice in that, then you're already at the campaign cap, so you can't go any higher than that. But you can certainly, with GM permission, buy more powers, different powers. So you can do something like, maybe you can make the area so hot that it becomes uncomfortable for other people, mm-hmm. and uh, that makes them weaker. Um, or there's all sorts of different things that you can do. But essentially, once you've hit that power cap, the GM adjusts the power cap, which they can do. Mm-hmm. You are pretty much at ten dice, or whatever you do. So the so so, so the, you don't. Have to, oh, I was gonna say you don't really have to worry about um, Daredevil turning into Superman because you've got that that limit just built into the system. Mm-hmm. Um. Now, when it comes now, when it comes to the, when it comes to that, um, when te- when testing it, when testing or just playing when in a ca- in a campaign that's aimed to be street level. Um, have you had a situation where somebody where somebody doesn't somebody has points but doesn't know where they can advance them to without going over the cap? Oh yeah, that's something that um, I think you'll run into something like that in just about any game you play, where a uh, player just doesn't know where they want their character to go, or they don't really have any great ideas. Um, I think in a situation like that, that's a great time where. The game master can sit down with you and and discuss op- discuss options, mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, and maybe even do that with the entire table. Say, you know, I don't know where super strong guy can go because he's already as strong as he can get and he's already as invulnerable as he can get. What other powers should I think about? The whole table can work together. Maybe the game master can come up with some su suggestions. Um, you know, it's it's a problem that I think is common, especially in, in systems like superhero games where you're buying things with points and not just leveling up, like in D&D mm -hmm. &D or Pathfinder. Mm -hmm. um, but I think even D&D &D and Pathfinder run into those problems too. You, you yeah, can run do. into... You know, I'm I'm not sure where I want my character to go from here. So what what should I do? Um, although it's I'd say D and D and Pathfinder have the have a, have a side problem of where of where they want to go is not the rules aren't exactly letting them. Um, say for instance mm -hmm. the the specificness when it comes to spell lists. Um, but that, yeah, sure. But, but that's a that's a whole that's a whole other um, can of worms. Now, <laughs> when it when it when it comes to when it comes to not when it comes to a setting such as Nocturne, um, I'm curious. I'm with a, a lot of times with um with a lot of Iron Age approaches. You either you either have one of two approaches. You either have a it's either based in a actual city, like say New York. In fact, a lot of them are going to be New York because, well, that's where Marvel's headquarters was. Um, or you're going right. to have a pastiche of some of some typically East Coast city, um, where there, where there's certainly elements of different types, but no, but it's but it's hard to it's hard to pin down exactly where it is. Like say. It's not uh, it's not outright stated where in the in the U.S. Gotham City is, but a lot of people assume um, somewhere between New York and Boston. Mm -hmm. um, is not is Nocturne is Nocturne in that kind of pastiche motif where it's there's el there's elements of known cities, but it's not it's not trying to be any any specific city. Um, no, Nocturne is actually based on a real place, um, and I'll give you a little bit of the history of it. It was um, I was originally inspired to start creating this this this, this setting um, after I saw the movie The Crow with Brandon Lee, and um, that of course took place in Detroit. But at the time, I knew nothing about Detroit. I'd never been there. Um, I really didn't know anything about it. Um, so I created my own city that was just called the City ran a game in that and then i started wondering you know i was i started thinking to myself that i should, I should make it more real you know this is just a generic city uh, it doesn't really exist anywhere i should make it some place that makes sense so i took a place that i know fairly well which is new orleans mm -hmm. and um i built the city there um changed the name to nocturne because i thought it sounded cool and um sort of rewrote the history so that everything that ever happened in the real world in Louisiana, in New Orleans, um, hap still happens in Nocturne, but it's always 10 times worse. So if there was a, um, if there was a battle and 500 people got killed, then in Nocturne, there was a battle and maybe four or 5,000 people got killed. If there was a disaster where 20 people died, then, uh, in Nocturne, 200 people died. Mm -hmm. um, I just took everything about New Orleans, the city that, as I said, I know and I love very much. Um, I was born there. And I I just I cranked it up. I made it as dark and as um, scary and as hopeless as I could make it. Um, and then I added superheroes so that you know, there's, there's a, a level of hope now. There's, you know, you can save the city. It's, mm -hmm. it's bad. Without you being there, it would be way worse. I got, I got gotcha. you. <laughs> now, when it comes to when it comes to the, when it comes to the partic the this particular city, um, a lot of a lot of times in ur in urban style campaigns, there's a certain emphasis on factions, Ev like diff different different factions all throughout all vi all vying for control in one form or another and the players being the proverbial um, wild card is nocturne in a mm -hmm. similar vein to this 
Nocturne is has a number of powerful gangs um, that uh, control different parts of it, different territories. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, um, all of the gangs pay homage to a very powerful and wealthy man named um, Ephraim Roderick, who is sort of what I call him the, my version of the kingpin, where you know there might be different gangs. There might be a Russian gang. There might be an Italian gang. There might be a Jamaican gang. But everybody... Um, no matter who they are, ends up working for Mr. Roderick in the end. And when it comes when it comes to the, when it comes to the whole work the, the whole working for him, um, does that does that does that also include um, super super villains and to some extent super villains? Um, it would. Probably would not include the superheroes, although it would certainly make an interesting campaign where you were working on the inside to try to bring him down. <laughs> but yes, he definitely has uh, a number of supervillains or other powerful people um, who are working for him. Um, and then um, with our Kickstarter, uh, once hopefully we'll get the villains book funded, and that has a number of other um, leaders, powerful leaders and um, other powerful criminals, um, supervillains and normal people as well. So there's there's a whole lot of stuff going on in Nocturne. Mm -hmm. Now, when it now um when it comes to the when it comes to the when it comes to the setup, I'm guess I'm guessing that within the within the book of Nocturne, it's separated by different di by different um districts. If so. I'd like you to go. I'd like you to go into a few examples of what um, one c what someone could expect when it comes to threats or just points of interest in those particular areas. Oh yeah, there's some. Um, I mean, I've been running games in Nocturne since mid '90s, I would say. So I mean, it's there's a lot of history and there's a lot of different things that you can do. A lot of places that you can go. Mm -hmm. um, there's, of course, there's all the different um, wards in Nocturne itself. Um, a ward being a sort of like a political boundary in the city. Mm -hmm. um, and each one of them has their own hangs. Each one of them has their own threats. Each one of them, um, there's supernatural threats because there are a lot of graveyards in the, uh, in the city. Um, a lot of very old graveyards. Mm -hmm. Um there are um, the city has just uh, only a few years ago there was a really bad uh, hurricane that rolled through the city destroyed a lot of the infrastructure and they're still sort of recovering from that so there's a um, one of the first adventures that we're going to be having is called Merciless Hospital which is uh, the the old hospital in the center of the city was abandoned after the storm hmm. now it's people believe it's haunted um, so there's a bunch of adventures that you could have in and around the old hospital. Um, there's, um, I mean, there's so much, it's, it's hard to know where to start to tell you <laughs> where everything is. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I just, I think it's, there's so much it's, um, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to sound like I'm being boastful or anything, but there's so much research in this book, mm -hmm. um, and there's so many adventure plots and seeds and ideas that um, if you read through this book and you can't come up with a, at least a dozen adventures, and I've done something terribly wrong, but I think that you will easily be able to come up with all kinds of stuff for, to keep your characters excited and, and interested. I got, I got you. Now, when it comes now, when it comes to when it comes to heroes. Um, and, re and and integrating heroes within th within this particular setting um there's always there's always been the the awkwardness of of put of putting of putting the good the good old fashioned on the on the streets barefisted vigilantes with a lot in the same in the same room as the more magically inclined or technologically inclined kind kind of heroes um within something like blood and justice do you ha do you have an did you put anything in, whether it be a GM aside or something, to help um, e to help even that out? Yeah. So um, 
one of the things in the book is an adventure called Heartbreaker, which is essentially the the city for a very long time didn't have only had one superhero, um, whose name was Heartbreaker, and uh, Heartbreaker took on uh, occasionally sort of like a, a Batman type character would take on apprentices or team up with other minor heroes um, or just just meet people and become friends with them um, and then uh, the adventure starts with Heart Heartbreaker has been murdered now all of uh, Heartbreaker's uh, protégés and uh, apprentices and friends and people who helped uh, on on the various adventures um, all of them come together to find out who killed her and why and to you know find some measure of justice or for the death of heartbreaker um and so this gives you the opportunity to bring together different characters uh whether you're like you said you could be uh you could be someone who's uh, magic uh, sorcerer or you know someone who's possessed by a demon or something like that um, you could be uh, a, a Punisher type who, you know, uses their guns and their knives to fight crime. You could be someone like, um, you know, uh, Luke Cage, who, you know, mysteriously came upon powers and finds himself invulnerable and super strong. Mm -hmm. um, but all of these characters have a single link, which was Heartbreaker. Now that Heartbreaker is gone, you are you have to become the city's heroes. Now... When it comes to when it, com when it comes to when it comes to that, um, I'm cu I'm curious. If, I'm cu I'm curious if there if um if there's but if there's a few um a few example instances of how of how a new character could be could be linked with Heartbreaker in one form or another, whether whether it be direct, i.e., they were one of Heartbreaker's students, or b something a little bit more um, distant. Yes, absolutely. There's a bunch of different examples <clears throat> of uh, different characters in the book. Mm -hmm. um, there's several uh, example heroes, um, and you can certainly use them as um, uh, give you an idea of, of how you want to be linked to the hero. Mm -hmm. um, some, of them, some of them just sort of admired her from afar, um, you know, they, they may have seen her or they may have worked with her once or twice, but they don't really know her that well. Um, some of them may have, um, had their lives saved by her or perhaps they saved her life. Mm -hmm. Um, some of them could be, um, their, her protégés, people who, who she actually took under her wing to train. Um, you know, there's one character who is actually kind of a rival, you know, they, they didn't really get along, but... He still respected her greatly, so when someone killed her, you know, he's like, I I will not stand for this, you know. I didn't like her, mm -hmm. but I don't want her dead, you know. So, there's all kinds of different options. Mm -hmm. Now, I've, now with, even with a lot of, um, a lot of set, a lot of setting books, they will still have their own additions to the, to the sandbox, and one of the things that's me that's mentioned on the Kickstarter page that I'm curious about is what's referred to as the gritty combat rules. How how significantly does that change how combat normally works um, in PNP? Um, it adds a few different things. Um, one thing in Powers and Paragons, generally speaking, it's really really hard for a superhero to be killed. Um, you know you. If you're reading a Spider-Man comic book or a Captain America comic book, you don't you don't expect them to die. You know things could get pretty grim, things could be pretty tight for them, but you know they're going to survive somehow. Mm -hmm. um, with the gritty combat rules, that is not a guarantee. Um, characters can be killed if they're not careful, um, and that's just one example. There's other things where um, if you're badly injured, um, you can't just bounce back and you're fine the next day. Um, you, you have to take time to recover, mm -hmm. um, or else it can leave you with some debilitating injuries. Um, so it basically makes combat um, a little bit more dangerous. Uh, it it makes you want to think once or twice before you get into a fight, especially a fight that you're not sure if you can win or not. Um, because yeah, if even if you don't die, you could still be laid up. 
a hospital bed or in a clinic for for days afterwards. Mm -hmm. Now, it now it's mentioned it now when it comes to the when it comes to the mentioning about what um, powers, perks, and flaws are appropriate. Is is it a case where there's a sh where there's a short list of the of those things from the core book and what and what would be appropriate and what wouldn't, or is it or is it more of a general guideline advice kind of thing? Um, for the most part, it's it's uh, a list of different powers and stuff, um, certain things that just wouldn't really fit in with an Iron Age game, and it's things like um, space flight. You know, you're not. Generally speaking, you're not going to find a character in a Punisher comic book who's and can travel from planet to planet. Um, but I do also offer uh, a few other um, few optional ways of doing some of the powers. Um, so there's a power in Colors and Paragons called Hard to Kill, mm -hmm. um, which is usually only like a one point power because it's because in most superhero games you're not going to have to worry about being killed. On Prowlers and Paragons, since being killed is a real fear that you have to worry about, um, hard to kill is a little bit, cost a little bit more, just as an example. Also, I have a few new flaws in the game, the things that would fit in with a um, Iron Age game, mm -hmm. probably wouldn't fit in with more of a four-color type game. Um, things like, uh, there's, a, there's a flaw called Terminal Illness, where at some point during the game, um, sort of randomly, um, your character will eventually die. Um, he might have a terminal disease. Um, there might be something going on with him. Um, it might be like the crow, where uh, at the end of the crow's... Once once he had finished seeking vengeance on the people who had murdered him and his fiance, um, his, his new life was over. He wasn't going to stick around for any time after that. Mm -hmm. So... There's, uh, there's. I think I added a few cool things to uh, to the system. Yeah. Now, I'd also I'd also seen that you have that you have um eight te you have eight templates that you're you that are that you're putting into this book. Um, mm -hmm. When it when when it comes to when it comes to those particular templates, it. Um, were there were there any that were there any that were hard that were harder to nail down at first than others, or was it gent was it relatively easy to nail down what each of them would do without um without stepping on anyone else's toes? Um, no, it was actually fairly easy. I mean, um, once I came up with the with the different concepts, um, and they are, <clears throat> I've got different concepts like uh, there's a there's a gunslinger. So if you want to play a character like the Punisher, then there's a template where you can kind of take a look at this, and this is how you might want to build your character. There's another template that's the ninja. So if you want to play, you know, someone who's like Elektra, mm -hmm. um, then you've got an option for doing that. Um, there's a uh, heroic vampire template. So if you want to play um, uh, someone like a, a good guy version of Lestat, then that's an option. I was going to say Morbius, um, but that's... And each a of them Oh yeah, sure, sure. Like like Morbius, the living vampire. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. Um, but uh, yeah, so there's there's these different options, and there's a little. I mean, some of them have a little bit of overlap, but for the most part, they're they're all unique. Um, and the uh, the characters they they give you some options so that you can say, well, you know, I want to play this heroic vampire, but I want him to be a little bit different because you know, he does this instead of that. Mm -hmm. You can modify these templates pretty easily. Now, when it comes to when it come now when it come when it came to the random adventure ge generator, um, was that was that's how did how did that come about to get to get added into the book? Was it something that you had that you had been tooling around with at your own table, or was there a different path? <laughs> um, so, what's kind of funny about the uh, the random adventure generator is that for most of my gaming career I hated the idea of random adventure generators like I would see them in books and I would say ah oh, there's there's no way I would ever use this this is terrible I don't I don't like this but when I was writing this one up it just occurred to me that um you could make a fairly simple adventure 
just a couple of roles and could make it more complex by adding more roles. And eventually I came up with this idea where you're basically on this, have a number of different charts and you essentially just roll eight times um, once on each of these different charts. And at the end of it, you will have a sort of an eclectic mix of ideas. Mm -hmm. I mean, each of these, each one of these uh, ideas is usually just one or two words. And from there, you can build a whole adventure out of it. Um, and I, I gave several examples in the book. Um, I gave, I think, four, four different examples of just where I just sat there when, with, with uh, my word processor open and a, a die six in my hand. And I just rolled on these charts and I said, okay, here's what I got. You know, I, I rolled once. Uh, for the, the, the hook, and I got a mystery, and I rolled a second time for the location, and I got a swamp, and I rolled a third time for the goal, and so on and so forth. And then I sat down and I said, okay, well, how do I build an adventure out of this? And I um, actually wrote examples um, of these different ra completely random rolls that I made, um, and I think I came up with several kind of cool little short adventures. Um so the adventure, I, I, you know, again, I don't, I don't want to brag, but I think it's a really clever uh, uh, and fairly simple um, series of tables and charts uh, where you can come up with a really cool adventure without too much trouble. Um, and tell the truth, I use this now all the time. I'm running uh, games at conventions because mm -hmm. if I can't come up with something, and I just I just roll this up, and 15 minutes later, I'm ready to go. Uh, yeah, it's and that do, that does bring me to to the um, to the alternate campaign settings that you put that you put in. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm I'm cu I'm curious if this if this was a case of 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 um of Ideas that ca that came up as you were as you were working and doing research on on developing the on developing a place like Nocturne, or if it had a different route, because you've got Nocturne itself a um, a a nine a nineties cartoon inter interpretation, um, a mm -hmm. sword and sorcery approach, and a supers meet civil war kind of approach. Yeah. Um. This is something that I like to do just as a as a creator of worlds. Something that I've always liked to do is um, how would you use a setting like this for a universe? So I thought about how you would use Nocturne in a like in a fantasy setting. If you were going to roll it, run it like using something like D and D or another fantasy game, mm. and um, I came up with the idea of uh, a campaign called the Time of the Fall, in which um, it's you know an age of powerful barbarians and mysterious sorcerers, and there's a kingdom on the edge of a swamp um, that's full of corruption and and darkness and crime and stuff like that. So it's still it's still Nocturne. It's just in a world where Conan would feel at home, for instance. Um, so that's. It's kind of the the different types of settings, um, and then I have the one inspired by the '90s cartoons. Is I call it Iron Age, the animated series. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and it's it's much less gritty. Um, you're less likely to be killed in this setting because it's you know, a PG-rated cartoon, um, but it still has it still takes place in the same city. It still takes place in Nocturne. It's just um, the sort of the tone and the mood of the game is going to be a little bit different. I get, I I can certainly get I can certainly get behind that. Um, now, with with all with all of that with all that said, what are you shooting for as far as a to, as far as a um, total page count? Um, it's going to be give or take a hundred pages. Mm -hmm. um, full color, and um, I mean the book is basically it's already written. We already have uh, almost all of the artwork in. It's already pretty much laid out and everything. So, um, you know, the Kickstarter is basically here to help us pay for 
the art and for a few other things that need to be finished. But once the Kickstarter's over, um, I think we're going to have at least a PDF in people's hands within a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And what? And um, within the now, as far you said it, you said within a couple. Within a couple of weeks, so a couple of weeks after the after all the stuff that needs to get shaken out of the Kickstarter gets shaken out. Exactly, that's right. Yeah, I, I can I can certainly I can certainly see that I can certainly see that. Um, and I I do want to take the time to to uh, offer my congratulations on on the fact that this managed to get this managed to get funded in less in less than a day. And at the time of this recording, is oh. sitting at six thousand and change. We're real happy. We, we're hoping to uh, get a little bit more in the next few days. You know, Kickstarters usually start out really well, and then they kind of do a lull in the middle, and then they they usually end pretty strong. So we're hoping to end real strong. Um, we'll get a couple of uh, really cool stretch goals going. We've got two uh, adventures uh, and a book of villains. Um, that are almost ready to go. So hopefully uh, we'll, we'll do really well on the Kickstarter and we'll get all those out to everybody. I got I got you. And I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing how, how that turns out. But with all that said, I do <laughs> want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. <laughs> Well, I really, really appreciate you having me. It's um, great to talk to you. Yep. And, uh, I mean, we'll do it again sometime. Oh, I, I have a, I have a feeling that 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 will come to pass. Um, <laughs> and of course, of course, of course, as what at any time you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I'd love to be back. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>